Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a series on the two small books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is lesson number nine in that series entitled Trials, Tribulations, and Lists. That's an interesting title. Well, let's see what that's all about. Uh, but as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow now with our heads recognizing your presence and thanking you for the guidance that you have given us through Scripture and the guidance you give us as we meet here from time to time to talk about these lessons which are for all of our help around the world. Be with those who are listening as well as those who are here that each one of us may receive our blessing as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, sometimes, laughingly, I hope, it has been suggested that when the Bible reading starts and one gets to the genealogies, one should stop and end one's reading. Uh, you probably all have heard people talk about how they get bogged down in the genealogies. But those genealogies are present for a reason. God has not included anything in Scripture that is not there for some reason. I mean, think about how much time is covered by the Bible and, and God had to decide what he was going to put in that space. For one thing, God is concerned about every detail of every person's life. What is your understanding of God's record system in heaven? Does he really know everything about us? Does that scare you? I, um, I've sometimes compared the record system to heaven to probably the best thing we know about, and that would be a hard drive. But I'm sure God is way ahead of that. I've wondered sometimes if he has a bunch of little brains sitting up there that keep track of everything. <laughs> Their brains are so much more efficient than anything we have. Anyway, there's some comments about that. Dennis? Yes, Jesus is weighing the character of every individual. If our motives are not pure, if our desire to please self is stronger than our desire for righteousness, or to glorify God, we may rest assured that nothing is hidden from his eye, and that the desires of our hearts, as well as the acts of our lives, will be considered in the judgment. Ellen G. White, Signs of the Times, 1855. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the return of some things that have been taken. Remember what those were? Yeah, they were the golden and silver utensils that were from the temple. Okay. The list we have here is gold, and bo gold bowls for offerings, 30, silver bowls for offerings, 1,000, other bowls, 29, small gold bowls, 30, small, small silver bowls, 410, and other utensils, 1,000. That's a lot of expensive hardware. And, of course, we know how it got there. How did it get to Babylon and then on to Persia? It was taken in Babylon in, in Nebuchadnezzar's probably first, second, or maybe third invasion of Judah, recorded in Daniel 1, 1, and 2, etc. Gold and silver utensils prepared by the specially trained people of God had been taken from Solomon's temple by Nebuchadnezzar's army in 605 B.C. Remember the story of Belshazzar. Many years later, in his final feast as Babylon was being conquered by Cyrus and, Medo -Pers and the Medo-Persians, as recorded in Daniel 5. That event occurred in October of 539 B.C., and we've talked about this before, but we can nail down those dates quite precisely because of a number of factors, um, events that people... For example, one, one example is that... <clears throat> Some people recorded certain years in which a, a, a sun eclipse on, occurred on a certain day in a certain place, and then a, a moon eclipsed on another day, on a t and they can just turn the astronomical clocks back, and they can say, whoop, we know exactly what year that was. And uh, so that's a pretty amazing. The, in October of 539 B.C., Nabopolassar's son Belshazzar had been left in charge of Babylon because Nabopolassar was more interested in things that were happening over in Arabia Neither of them thought there was any danger to Babylon. I mean, there's no enemies can get into this city. It's impregnable, right? So these utensils that we're talking about were things that were made even in the wilderness? Probably. At least some of them. 
and others and were probably the earrings made, that people brought and yeah. other gold and, and so others were probably made in the days of Solomon when they made the new temple at that time yeah it's interesting to review the events of that night, including the explanation of the handwriting on the wall, which preceded the appointment of Daniel to a high position in the new government of Medo-Persia, and the subsequent decree by Cyrus to allow the first return of Jews to Jerusalem. And why did Cyrus readily ag agree to let them go back to Jerusalem? And he was shown his name in the uh, he said, prophecy. Look, Right here in our prophetic books, this is written 120 years ago or whatever, and it says you're going to allow these, you know, and, and you can imagine that that would be a pretty impressive thing for an ancient emperor. So, Or a current emperor. Yes. I always thought Daniel had a lot to do with that. <laughs> also possible. Yeah. He was there. What do you think Zerubbabel and later Ezra's appeal to convince people to join them was? What would you say to them? Well, Please come and build your home from scratch out of a pile of rubble. Well, what convinced people to move to the West in the United States? Free land, mm -hmm. an opportunity to start over. Mm -hmm. You've been in jail. We'll give you a new start. Yeah. I hope not too You're many. a bandit. We'll give you a new start. Yeah. Well, do you think Zerubbabel and Ezra made any appeals to their religious convictions? You would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to be, you know, a subservient people scattered in exile and say, would you like to go home? And, I mean, th that should intentionally have some kind of an appeal. Well, when they got ready to go back to Jerusalem, Cyrus gave them that's Zerubbabel and Joshua, gave them 5,400 gold and silver bowls and other articles to take back to the temple. Notice that Ezra, in Ezra 1, 9-11, gives considerable detail, while Daniel, in Daniel 1, 1 and 2, only gives a big picture about these events. So, why do you suppose there's that difference? What do we know about that, Margaret? The history of nations speaks to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. This is from Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings, page 536, paragraph 2. He says elsewhere that God is acting, as it were, behind the scenes, you know, behind the, the, the curtains. And it, it looks like we're in charge of everything that's going on out front. But no, not really. God is, is in charge. The, is he still doing that with our politics? Well, um, remember that we know at this point in time that God is withdrawing slowly, slowly, slowly and letting the devil have more and more control. So I don't think I need to say anything more than that. <laughs> well, Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 talk about lists of things, uh, of people and, and animals, etc. From these lists, we get an idea of what kind of people chose to return to Jerusalem and the surrounding territories. There were priests and Levites, temple guards, temple workmen, and descendants of Solomon's servants, interestingly. In addition to a number of Israelites and priests who could not prove their genealogy. Now, here's the generic question that we need to ask ourselves. Did some of the people who had formerly lived in the northern kingdom return at this time? Possibly. Yeah, maybe. Can't you give me a better answer than possibly? <laughs> nope, if, it, if I don't have a thus saith the Lord, I, yeah, it's that's all true. speculation. But we do have, uh, uh, what was her name? Anna, the prophetess yeah. in Jesus' time, who was a descendant, uh, part of uh, Asher, the that. tribe of Asher. So how would how would she maintain that if, if she yeah. ha didn't have... And there are some others that are in the various kinds of records. So probably at least a few of those who have been a part of the northern kingdom and probably especially some of the priestly groups probably came back at that time. That's but, they, but they were all Levites. Levites, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
But remember but that Levites that had lived in the northern yeah in the northern right. territory right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> both Ezra two and, and Nehemiah seven tell us that the total number of exiles who returned with the rubble and Joshua was forty two thousand three hundred sixty. However, if you add up the individual numbers, you will notice some apparent discrepancies. How do we explain these dis- those discrepancies as listed in our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide? Well, you see that Ezra 2 says 24,144. Nehemiah 7 says 25,000. Oh, we're missing a zero. Zero, zero, six. I'm sorry. Priests, 4,289. Four, four, four in Nehemiah, 4,289. That number is the same. Levites, singers, gatekeepers, 341 and 360. Temple servants, descendants of Solomon's servants, 392, 392. Though it's the same. Men of unproven origin, 652 and versus 642. And so we have a difference of about, what is that? 1,200. 2,000? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 1,200, more or less, something like that. Why is that like that? And yet the total numbers given in both is more than either of those columns. Exactly. Yeah. And is the same number. And is the same number. What do you suppose? Uh, the SD Bible commentary suggested that uh, the Ezra one might be those, uh, the counting when they left Babylon, and Nehemiah 7 was uh, a later revision of that. Why? Uh, they, don't, they don't say. Although maybe they picked up some people along the way as they were coming, and maybe a few passed away as they were traveling. Or some who sort of traveled on their own and arrived there and said, I want to be a part of the group. Yeah. Oh, awesome. they were leaving this morning? I thought it was tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's some other expl- another possible explanation that the Bible commentary probably would prefer not to comment on, and that's that these numbers... And these ancient documents were written in a, they, the numbering systems they used. They didn't have nice little numbers like this. The numbering systems they used were pretty confusing sometimes. It's not always possible to know exactly how much those numbers are. So that's another possibility. So why do you think God was, why did God care? Why did he need to record this stuff in that much detail? Was Ezra particularly concerned about to make sure of those which were legitimate Jews and who were not? Well, if you couldn't prove your genealogy, yeah. and I have to tell you my story, uh, when I was preparing to return from Africa the first time, I thought maybe I would spend a two or three months in, in Israel and see if I could learn Hebrew. So there were some advertisements. I uh, got them clear out in Africa. Some advertisements that said, and this is way before the days of the internet, uh, it said, come to such a kibbutz and you can learn Hebrew. So I wrote them a nice letter saying, I'd love to come to such and such a kibbutz and learn Hebrew. I got a short letter back that says, send us a letter from your rabbi. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> proving your genealogy, is that what proving, they want? I guess, proving my genealogy or whatever. You have to be... Approved by a rabbi before they'll let you in. I will say, however, that I just saw on the internet uh, a few days ago uh, a young lady working in Israel that says, I will teach you Hebrew online if you want to sign up. So, I don't know. Maybe it's not quite so strict as it used to be. Well, at least the gov- the Jewish governor at that time would not allow them to participate in all the priestly activities and benefits without consulting the Urim and the Thummim. Oh, boy. What do we know about the Urim and the Thummim? Exodus 28.30 says, Put the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece, so that Aaron will carry them when he comes into my holy presence. At such times, he must always wear this breastpiece so that he can determine my will for the people of Israel. That's taken from the Good News Bible. And then in Deuteronomy 33, 8, about the tribe of Levi, he said, You, Lord, reveal your will by the Urim and the Thummim through your favorite faithful servants, the Levites. You put them to the test at Massah. 
and proved them true at the waters of Meribah. Okay, now do you remember what the story was with the Urim and the Thummim? It was a yes-no answer that mm -hmm. God could give. Little stones that were sort of on the corner of the restway, maybe were on top of the shoulders or down here somewhere like that. And supposedly when the answer was yes, way well, one of them would light up, and when the answer was no, the other one would turn dark. So they still had that after the the, uh, Seems the like exile, it. that they still had the... Seems like it. Hmm. Seems so. Why do you suppose that these thousands and thousands of people chose to return to Palestine? Did they have any idea what the conditions of the city and the territory around Jerusalem was? I mean, remember, probably most, probably by far the majority, probably 90 plus percent of those who returned had never been to Palestine. There were probably a few elderly people who decided to come back, but we know there were. That's Haggai tells us that. But uh, not many, I'm sure. Imagine if you're 80 or 90 years old and someone says, let's walk a couple hundred, about a thousand miles and go back home. Um, you might think about it twice. They must have had some uh, some uh, reason that they. I mean, some. It's a home. That's their homeland. That's where they wanted. They, they had, had history. A, had history there. That's where their ancestors all lived and were buried. Um, well, they just, you know, had a well, a very emotional connection yeah. there too. Or they had a quest for adventure. You know, the younger people had never been there, and probably they weren't the higher levels of society in Babylon either. The people that had a lot as far as homes and lands probably Businesses. stayed. A lot of them stayed, so the people that could just pack up and leave yeah. didn't have a lot to lose back in Babylon. Yeah. Well, they must have recognized that it was a long way to Palestine. And no doubt the journey could be dangerous. I mean, one of the issues, one of the possibilities is you'd go on this journey and you die mm -hmm. en route. Okay? Comments. From the, from the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 376, it says, By now the Jews who remained in the land of exile had been there for almost a century and a half. Excavations of Nippur have brought to light numerous documents that show that many wealthy Jews lived in that region of Mesopotamia during the reign of Artaxerxes I. Hence, it may have been a difficult task for Ezra and his fellow leaders to convince as many to return as did accompany him. These returning colonists could expect only a hard pioneering life in the old homeland with far fewer comforts than in Babylonia. In view of these considerations, it is surprising to find that Ezra succeeded in persuading almost 2,000 families to cast in their lot with their brethren in the old homeland. I have yeah. a question there. It, yeah. To me, a century and a half is 150 years. How does that relate to the 70 years that Jeremiah... Oh, well, okay. The differences between 70 years was return of, of Zerubbabel and Yeshua. Uh, 150 years now is the return of, of Ezra. Ezra, at the time of Ezra. Yeah. Okay. And this is also the, when does the 70 years start? Was that with the 605? Yes. Okay, the so seven, with the, the first years, capture. You're talking about the 70 years that were promised yeah. to the Jews, yes. Yeah, the 605 Correct. with the first capture. Okay. Now, at 606, 605, um, Ezra sent out a call to get people to join him and to return to Palestine and the second group of returnees. When they had all gathered at the Hava Canal, he discovered that no Levites were among them. That's a little concerning. So he chose 11 trustworthy men and sent them to Ido, who was probably the head of a community of Jews living not far away. We know nothing else about Ido or Casaphia, where supposedly he lived, that are mentioned in this verse. But fortunately, there, were, there was a generous response. 22 Levites and an additional 220 temple workmen joined the group after that appeal. So the total number of Levites, singers, and gatekeepers was in the 300s. Mm -hmm. So yes. they had to convince a lot of, a lot of people to go. Yep. yep. Do we have a text where that is described? Yeah, I mean, 
where it talks about the, 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 the him sending sending the, sending back to yeah. this Edo and Castilla. Yeah, I think it's isn't it in um, so let's see. It's not in our handout. No, I should have put it in there. It will be. Yes. We'll get it put in there. Yeah, I think it'd be uh, good. That should be in I don't remember reading that. Ezra seven, I believe. No, it should be Ezra yeah, it should be Ezra seven. Give me just a moment and let's see if I can find that. We'll get it. That, and that and it'll be Ezra, there. Ezra eight. Um, it's actually Ezra eight, nineteen and twenty. Hmm. So that text is actually under fifteen there. Yeah. Okay. So he got his people. Ezra was afraid to ask the emperor for protection for his journey. He had told the emperor that God would be able to care to care for them. So before they departed, they had a period of fasting and prayer, and God did, in fact, protect them. I mean, you wonder how many marauding tribes they passed through, and they, if people had known that they were carrying that much gold and silver and so forth, not to mention whatever their valuables that they themselves had. I mean, of course, it was a, you know, we're talking about a group now that has, what, 7,000 men? No. Uh, 2,000 men. 2,000 men or 2,000 plus men. And whoever, so I mean, it wasn't you could just swoop in and just grab something. Not for a small group of robbers. Yeah, they probably had weapons with them as well. Yeah, some. Yeah. But they were relying on God's protection. So, however, 13 years later, when Nehemiah returned with a small group of associates carrying in important letters to the enemy groups around the Israelites and also probably a significant amount of gold and silver, he did ask for some army officers to accompany him. Uh, why was it all right for him to do it and not for them? Well, here's, here's the, the text, Nehemiah 2.9. The emperor sent some army officers and a troop of horsemen with me, and I made the journey to West Euphrates. There I gave the emperor's letters to the governors. Well, it's a matter of numbers, probably. He didn't have yeah. that big a group. So the big group is a little more yeah. difficult for somebody to attack. And also he was on, uh, Nehemiah, when he went with a small group, was on an official government mission probably as opposed to and they were probably all traveling on horseback a relatively small group yeah. moving fairly quickly yeah. yeah there were those there who would have opposed them and so having a military presence yeah. was better than just Nehemiah saying I'm yeah if you yeah if you show up with a letter from the emperor and you're all by yourself people might have said hmm, hmm. oh you know? we thought he was yeah well, here's a question. Is it all right to ask or is it wrong to ask for someone, perhaps even someone of the world, to assist us when there's a need as Nehemiah did when he returned? Some people have some real concerns about our hospitals, for example, in this country, accepting government funds. Is that a mistake? Also have non advanced employees. Mm-hmm. Including some ho Adventist hospitals having almost no Adventist physicians, no or almost no. Mm -hmm. Well, is it showing is it showing a lack of faith if we uh, if we ask for healing and then go we go to a medical doctor who might be able to help? I mean, where do we draw? Obviously, we're talking about where do we draw the line? I mean. We could, trying to build a billion-dollar hospital over here, say, God, just give us the money. You, you can do it. And God could if he wanted to. Um, what about that? Well, in a way, involving other people is an outreach in itself. Mm -hmm. it's the association you have with these people, their yeah. willingness to help a good cause. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, as a parent, you could give your children most anything, but is that the right thing to do? Yeah. Well, think about the example of Jesus. It's always fair to, to follow his example. One place where he had something like that going on is John chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. 
Remember, there was a blind man who had been born blind. And he was there begging. And uh, Jesus talked to him briefly. Then after this, he said, after he said this, Jesus spat on the ground, made some mud with a spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and he said, go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means scent. So the man went, washed his face and came back seeing. So this is medicinal mud. Mm -hmm. So which did the healing, Jesus or the mud? I asked that question first. <laughs> I think the faith that the man had that he acted on what Jesus asked him to do. Huh? It's like Naaman in the Old Testament who yeah. didn't want to dip in the water and he was talked into doing, well, dipping in the water didn't heal him. His faith in God is what healed him. Okay. And the woman with yeah. the issue of blood who touched Jesus' garment, yeah. and yeah. Jesus said, uh, your faith has saved you, go in peace. But now... Jesus knew about all that. Why did he spit in the ground and make mud? In that day, that was medicine. In those days, well, it's more than that. There's, a, and we don't have time to go to all the details here, but this happened on a Sabbath. It was against the law to apply any kind of medicine to your eyes, well, above the neck on the Sabbath. That was one Why issue. Above the neck is it okay. Below the neck, yeah. Well, some kinds Where of stuff. Where do we get that? That's a, that's was one of the Jewish rules about really? keeping the Sabbath, yeah. That's sure interesting. Not only that, if you spit on the ground and you mix it up, you're you're producing a medicine. That's against the law, on the, working on <laughs> yeah, the Sabbath. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and you know, th there's a whole collection of those. are just a couple of the, the things. Jesus. Said, so what was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to say some very specific things about Sabbath keeping. Now, it was true that there are groups of people in those days who believed that spit had some medicinal properties. So maybe that was part of why Jesus did that as well. We, we just don't know. Well, um, <clears throat> most of the medicines that we use today come from, some na come from some natural source and have been proven to work for the purposes excuse me, for which they are prescribed. If Jesus were once again on this earth as a human being and wanted to heal someone, would he use such medicines? Or would he go around as he did in the old days, just touch people and make them well? Good this is, question. These are obviously thought questions. Yeah. You aren't suggesting that maybe Jesus would use antihypertensive medications and mm. chemotherapy and... Well, one of the classic cases that people argue with me about at the clinic all the time is the question of using statins for treating cholesterol. And they say, oh, you know, that's a dangerous medicine and you want me to take it for the rest of my life <clears throat> because my cholesterol is too high. And my response to them is statins were, are something that the people in the Far East have been eating for millennia. It's made from a red rice yeast that grows on a kind of red rice that grows in the Far East. And these companies just take that yeast over the top, off the top of the rice and extract it and purify it <coughs> me, and sell it to you in a pill. Does that make it any different than the natural? Well, I guess not. So and it, a lot of people say, well, okay, that makes it more natural. And so there are a lot of people who feel like it's okay to take something if it's natural. So statins are made from red rice? Red rice yeast. The yeast, yeast. that grows on the red rice. Huh. That's right. Exactly. They're not, I mean, it's just a matter of purifying the stuff and, and then they they modify it a little bit to try to prove that they actually did something. But, it just but changed. statins work. If yeah. you didn't do it, would you want your cholesterol to keep climbing higher and higher? So it seems like when you have a choice between yeah. something that works and something that's a little bit dangerous if you get out of control. Yeah. Common sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look at um, something about Nehemiah. I'm going to read you a few verses. Nehemiah 12, starting with verse 27. When the city wall of Jerusalem was dedicated, the Levites were brought in from wherever they were living so that they could join in celebrating the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals and harps. 
I'm not quite sure how what kind of a combination you would have with cymbals and harps. Dennis, oh, you're a musician. Do you think that would be a great musical depends, combination? Depends on what you mean by cymbals. They <laughs> yeah, could be exactly. tinkling sim- cymbals, yeah. very light uh, yeah. kinds of things. The Levite families of singers gathered from the area where they had settled around, Jerusalem and from the towns around from several different places. The pr- priests and the Levites <clears throat> performed ritual purification for themselves and the people at the gates and the sea wall. I assembled the leaders of Judah on top of the wall and put them in charge of two large groups that marked to march around the city giving thanks to God. And I'm not going to read all the details, but... So how here, would you like to march with a harp? Yeah, exactly. So here are these two groups, and one goes around the city wall in one direction, the other one goes around the city wall in the, well, in the other direction, and they meet by the temple. And then they, they, they go down from there and, and have, hold a ceremony in the temple itself. So that was their way of celebrating. So Nehemiah had left his job as the emperor's wine taster and went to Jerusalem to finish the wall. What kind of wall was built around Jerusalem that was so large and substantial that large numbers of people could march around the city on top of the wall? Imagine that. I mean, some you know, we often think, oh, well, someone built a wall, maybe it's a foot thick or something else like that, just to keep arrows out. No, this is a wall, huge wall. They could probably drive a chariot on top of the wall Mm -hmm. around the city. Yeah. Notice that Nehemiah traveled with one group in one direction. Ezra traveled uh, with another group in the other direction. Ezra felt it was important to document even the number of animals sacrificed that day as a special celebration. You can find that in Ezra 8, verse 35. Surely at the time of the completion of the wall, there was a lot of reasons for celebrating. Many of the people had found places in the surrounding towns and cities to reestablish themselves and build homes. There's a puzzling passage in Nehemiah 11, 1 and 2. Myra? Yes. The leaders settled in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people drew lots to choose one family out of every ten to go and live in the holy city of Jerusalem, while the rest were to live in the other cities and towns. The people praised anyone else who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Let's go. You would think that everybody would want to stay in Jerusalem, but they have a new wall there, you're protected. They praise the volunteers. Why are they praising the volunteers? If it weren't for that last sentence, you would almost think that they drew lots for the privilege of going to Jerusalem. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a lot of rubble to clear. It was a lot of work to clear things and to build in Jerusalem. And remember, if you build in Jerusalem, you would be expected probably to house visitors at the time of the national celebrations. So that may be another factor. I don't know. Now, when they first went back, they built the temple around 515, I believe. They finished the temple around 515. But this is coming back in the 400s later. Yeah, this the wall was the like wall was finished. The wall was finished in 440, either 444 or 445. Yeah, I thought that was about. I mean 443, 444 or 443, because we're coming down. Yeah, sometime later. Nehemiah recognized that they needed a significant number of people living in homes in Jerusalem to, in order to one provide a significant number of people who would protect the city and defend it against enemies. Two, build homes that would be able to accommodate people from the surrounding villages who would need to escape to the walled city of Jerusalem if an enemy army approached. We need to remember that when Nebuchadnezzar finished conquering Jerusalem the third time, he had reduced it to a pile of rubble. Many of the Jews returning to Palestine recognized that it would be much easier to establish themselves in one of the smaller villages or towns surrounding Jerusalem than to live in Jerusalem itself. Uh, It's interesting to know, I was just looking at some more information about that today, they have, since the Israelites, the Jews, took over Jerusalem, basically, they have started doing a massive amount of archaeology around the Temple Mount. And they have now gotten down to the level of the, the days of Jesus. And they're now finding homes, pretty good-sized homes, with fancy stuff and mosaics and all kinds of stuff. This would be This would be probably a... Uh, uh, Caiaphas kind of a home or something and they're finding pretty major portions of these homes 
that they're digging up and, and you can see the walls and the floors and the, everything right there. And some of them, of course, have been burned. Jerusalem was burned. You can see where the, the evidence of the fires and so forth. Of course, that was a long time later. How many Adventists in our day are willing to pull up roots and move to an area with no, no Seventh-day Adventists to see if they can start a new church? Our workers are not reaching out as they should. Our leading men are not awake to the work that must be accomplished. When I think of the cities in which so little has been done, in which there are so many thousands to be warned of the soon coming of the Savior, I feel an an intensity of desire to see men and women going forth to the work in the power of the Spirit, filled with Christ's love for the perishing souls. Owen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 7, page 40. After the completion of the wall, the scriptures were read, but we do not know what portions of the books of Moses were read to the people on those eventful days. Do you suppose Deuteronomy 31 to 6 was part of what was read? And I quote, I have now given you a choice between a blessing and a curse. When all these things have happened to you and you are living among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you, I mean, think about reading that if you just come back from Babylon or from from Persia. You will remember the choice I gave you. If you and your descendants will turn back to the Lord and with all your heart obey his commands that I'm giving you today, then the Lord your God will have mercy on you. He will bring you back from the nations where he has scattered you and he will make you prosperous again. Even if you are scattered to the farthest corners of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back so that you may be, again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived. And he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors ever were. So maybe that was one of the drawing cards. The Lord your God will give you and your descendants obedient hearts so that you will love him with all your heart and you will continue to live in that land. That's the Good News Bible. Well, as we have mentioned, very few of the people were able to read the Hebrew Scriptures at that point in time. But Ezra and Nehemiah, being well-educated, knew of these prophecies. They chose to exercise their faith, knowing that God would be with them. While we celebrate those people who chose to return to Palestine, we recognize that only about 1-2% to of the Jewish people actually chose to do so. Why do you suppose so many decided to stay in Mesopotamia and Persia? And what's happened to those people who decided to remain in Mesopotamia which is now Iraq, or Persia, which is now Iran. Consider this from Kim Helmagard in the USA Today from August 29 of 2018. In a nation that has called for Israel to be wiped off the face of the earth, the Iranian government allows thousands of Jews to worship in peace and continue their association with the country founded uh, more than 2,500 years ago. At its peak in the decades before Iran's Islamic Revolution in 1979, 100,000 to 150,000 Jews lived there, lived here. According to the Tehran Jewish Committee, a group that lobbies for the interests of Iranian Jews. In the months following the fall of Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, uh, Iran's second and last monarch, they fled for Israel and the United States. Today, 12,000 to 15,000 Jews remain in Iran, according to the committee. It's a small minority in a nation of 80 million people. But consider, Iran is home to the Middle East's largest Jewish population outside Israel. And why do you suppose that is? Because that's... <coughs> Yeah, they never left from, yeah. from Medo-Persia. Why is it that none of the other countries have a large Jewish population? Because in recent times, because of the conflicts going on in Israel and Palestine and so forth, there's become, gotten to be such an animosity between Jews and Arabs and so forth that it's difficult for Jews to remain in a lot of those countries. Well... There are now far fewer Jews left in Iran than there were in Ezra's day. Margaret, I think you have something more about that. The number of Jews now living in Iraq, that would be Mesopotamia Mesopotamia and Babylon, is almost zero. 
present estimates of the Jewish population in Baghdad are eight. That was in 2007. Seven in 2008, five in 2013, and t or 10 in 2018. Among the American forces stationed in Iraq, there were only three Jewish chaplains. Wow. So the populations that used to live in those countries have been pretty much decimated. Yeah. Well, um, let's turn now to Nehemiah 12. We'll look at part of that. The following is a list of the priests and Levites who returned from exile with the rubble with son Shealtiel and with the high priest Joshua. Priests, and then there's a long list of names that I won't even pretend to pronounce. These mm -hmm. men were... But this is the lesson about lists. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. These men were leaders among all among all their fellow priests in the days of Joshua. And then there were Levites. The following were in charge of the singing of hymns or thanksgiving. And then there were Yeshua, Benui, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah. The following formed the choir that sang the responses. Bakbukiah, Uno, and their fellow Levites. Descendants of the high priest Joshua. And there's all they're all named there. Heads of the priestly clans. When jo Joachim was high priest, the following priests were uh, the heads of the priestly clans. Da 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 da, a whole bunch more names. Mm. Even some of them not listed. A record was kept of the heads of the Levite families and of the priestly families during the lifetimes of the following high priests. Da da da. And some of those priests lived quite a long time after that whole process. And they came there and they were assigned duties. These people lived during the time of Joachim, son of Joshua, and grandson of Jehozadak. And the name of Nehemiah the governor in the, in the time of Ezra the priest who was a scholar of the law. When the city wall of Jerusalem was dedicated, the Levites were brought in from wherever they were living so that they could join in celebrating. We already talked about that. So, why do you suppose Ezra felt it was necessary to mention all those names? Any idea? Well, the genealogies, they seem to have kept track of all of those things in the temple. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was important to them because the Messiah was going to come mm -hmm. through somebody. Uh, it would be a son of David. And uh, so there were all those reckonings to take place. And then your, your, also your inheritance, at least originally. I don't know about and it at this point. if you're thinking like a Jew, there's another reason. Now you only had to trace your ancestry back to those people. You didn't have to go all the way back to through all this kind of stuff because now you had to, you had documented yourself. You could trace your genealogy back to one of these people. You were in the clear. You were recognized as being authentic. Okay, mm. that's another factor. Nehemiah twelve. What, what did re being recognized as authentic get you? Well, it could let you. You could get. To, you could go and, and live in a kibbutz and learn Hebrew. Besides that. <laughs> Besides that. No, you, you could you could become an official. Uh, you you would be recognized. You admitted to Israel without asking any questions. You could move there and and and, and fi find a home and and live there. If you could prove that you had genealogy. Are you talking about today or back Even then? Even today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were be back in Ezra and Nehemiah's time. They were begging people to come. Yeah. Well. Here's a little bit of a, 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 a trivial question, but it was important for some people. Uh, in Nehemiah 12.22, let me just go ahead and read that again. A record was kept of the heads of the Levite families and the priestly families during the lifetimes of the following high priests. Now, how many of these high priests lived in the days of Ezra? So it could have been written in, in either Ezra or Nehemiah's time. Eliashib. They had a lot of problems with him. We know he was alive. Joyada, Jonathan, and Jadua. This record was finished when Darius, excuse me, was emperor of Persia. So, that raises the question, which Darius was it? We are not told whether Darius mentioned this verse as Darius II, who lived from, or ruled from 424 or 423 down to 405, 404 B.C., 
or Darius the third, who lived almost a hundred years later, three thirty six to three thirty one. Darius the second would fit in with what we know of the histories of Nehemiah and possibly also Ezra. Darius three did not reign until nearly eighty years later. If it was Darius three, that would that would create some real problems for those trying to create a chronology. Fortunately, it's quite certain that this passage is talking about Darius the second. Some biblical critics are determined to choose Darius the third, and thus to raise questions about biblical chronology. And I think we can basically dismiss those questions because there's no reason why we need to fight with them. But we need to be aware that some critics will try to do that. Some amazing things have been accomplished by Ezra and Nehemiah and their associates. There's no question about the fact that God had blessed them. Many people with different skills were needed to accomplish all that was done. Ezra focused particularly on the different types of individuals needed in the temple to care for the building and the surroundings and also to conduct the religious services. Have you ever wondered why God continued to work with the Jewish people even after some of them had been deported to Assyria and then others to Babylon? Should God have chosen another group of people and started over? How should God's children feel when they experience some kind of setback? It's a beautiful commentary in Steps to Christ, page 64. <clears throat> that fits pretty good with the 1888 message, too, when we think about the righteousness of Christ. This paragraph says, There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes, but we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God. He also maketh intercession for us. He desires to restore you to himself, to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. And if you will but yield yourself to him, he that hath begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more fervently, believe more fully. As we come to distrust our own power, let us trust the power of our Redeemer and we shall praise him who is the health of our countenance. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Steps to Christ, page 64. I mean, that's righteousness by Christ. Yeah, and you think about this, Not think ours. about this in, 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 in the times in which we live. We asked earlier, was God responsible for what's happening in politics? And in, we're now even thinking about war in the world. Um, is God somehow involved in that? We should pray for what we think is the right thing to do. But do we trust God and say, God, no matter what happens, we trust you. And we will continue to stand firm for your right and for your cause, no matter what happens. Are we, are we prepared to do that? Well, in earlier lessons, we noted that the prophecies of Daniel, which link very specifically with the events carried out by Ezra and Nehemiah, allow us to pin down the exact dates for one, the coming Messiah's anointing and baptism. That was at the end of the 69th week of the 70-week prophecy. His crucifixion on the cross, that's halfway through the 69th, the 70th week. And three, the stoning of Stephen and the final rejection of the Jewish people as a nation, not the individuals, but the nation, in A.D. 34, exactly 490 years after Ezra reached Jerusalem. And if you've had the privilege of visiting Corinth, and you had the privilege of visiting Delphi, and the further up in the continent of, of uh, Europe and in, in Greece there, it's amazing that we can nail down events in the life of Paul that fit exactly, that tell us that these dates are exactly right. It's amazing. Amazing. But who cares about all these dates? Basically, only Seventh-day Adventists. Now, why do we care about them? Well, I think we believe in prophecy. Mm -hmm. Not too many other churches spend much time talking about what the Bible tells us is coming. 
And in, we have... In we, fact, a lot of critics say God can't know what's going to happen in the yep. future. Yep. Yep. Well, well even, even in a temporal sense, if yep. you can control the future, you can predict it. So the, in the sense that God, if God can control events in the future, he can predict what's going to happen. But that... Uh, that, that that's, it. but that's not. Uh, there's, there's a. That's an excuse because there are things that aren't just God controlling something. But the, you know that takes away our would take away our freedom. But if right. you lay these all these prophecies out step by step, and you look at all the, the points along the way that you can nail down that date, it's just amazing. I mean, I I don't know how anyone can look at that. Well, I know what happens. Um, I have a famous commentary series in my in my study at home, and you open up this discussion of the Book of Daniel, and they they say that the the stories in the Book of Daniel are fairy tales. They're like Jack and the Beanstalk, and I mean this is the kind of stuff they're talking about. You know, there's no big seventy year prophecy. Yeah, you know, plus or minus a few issues doesn't really matter. You know, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't happen. We're not really sure. I mean... But when the, we dig deep into this genealogy and these dates, when we see them happen, doesn't that give us incredible confidence absolutely. in God's Word? Yep. Well, we know that the 2300-day prophecy tells us in, of Daniel 8.14 tells us that 1810 years later, that's you subtract the 490 years given to the Jews from... 2300 and you get 1810, a very important event would occur. Seventh-day Adventists believe that event was the beginning of the pre-Advent judge, uh, judgment in heaven. But of course, we have no specific event that we can look at and say, yes, here's what happened. We just we believe that something happened in heaven. And our, our, our critics, of course, make fun of that. But So that would have taken us to 1844. Yes. And if you look at the other prophecies about what's going to happen and what was going on in the world at that point in time, again, it's things that, I mean, there was a French Revolution and there was a dark day and there was an earthquake and there was a, the moon turned to blood and there was a, the, the establishing of the United States and all those things were leading up to and then the falling of the stars. I mean, you know, these things didn't happen like that just by chance. Well, how is God able to predict events so accurately hundreds of years in advance? Well, if you read Isaiah 40 to 55, God repeatedly says in those chapters, through Isaiah, of course, that one of the identifying marks of the true God is his ability to predict events far in the future. Does that seem like a convincing argument? If you think you can predict things even a few days in advance, I'll have you come and give me some advice about <laughs> investments. <laughs> well, that's John 14, uh, 29. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. John 14, 29. John 14, 29. That's yeah. one place. And Jesus predicted Peter's, <clears throat> Peter's uh, th- uh, denial of him three times you know, before the cock crows. So. Yeah. Repeatedly in Scripture, we can read about times when individuals or whole groups of people suffered terrible persecution or setbacks. For example, Isaiah 43.1. In Nehemiah 10.29, we read, about, we read that the people who had returned from Babylon joined themselves together in making a covenant promise to obey God's laws and requirements. In our study for this week, focusing on Ezra 2.8 as well as Nehemiah 7.10 and 12, we see who was involved and what they accomplished. Included in the list in Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7, there is itemization of animals that returned to Jerusalem with the first group of exiles. Why do you suppose Ezra counted even the animals? Was it because God cares about animals as well as human beings? Along with Noah's family, he preserved the animals in the ark. He was concerned about the animals living in Nineveh in Jonah's day. See Jonah 4.11. Having studied this lesson, why do you think Ezra thought it was necessary for them to include all those these lists? Was this at the special instruction of God? Why were these lists preserved? What should we what should they teach us about God? It seems quite clear that those long lists in Ezra and Nehemiah tell us that God knows all about our families, even the things which we own. 
Jesus himself said that God takes care of the sparrows and even counts the hairs on our heads. You remember Luke 12, 6 and 7. Isn't that sufficient reason for us to be concerned about every detail of our lives as well? Are you happy that God knows all the details of your life? Or does that bother you? Well, look at Acts 14, 22. They strengthened the believers and encouraged them. This is talking about the apostles. They strengthened the believers and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must pass through many troubles to enter the kingdom of God, they taught. So, we should expect troubles, right? So why do we need to go through a time of trouble just ahead of us in order to prepare us for living in a kingdom where there will be no problems, no troubles, no sin, no death, and no worries of any kind? Doesn't that seem like a <laughs> crazy contradiction? Well, we need to come down to Revelation, the third angel's message, where here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So uh, it demonstrates our relationship to him in the midst of the great controversy. Yeah. Uh, so we have controversy because there's a great yeah. controversy going on. The great controversy must come to a convincing conclusion before Jesus can come back again. It's not just God arbitrarily and say, okay, I guess it's time I'll come. That concludes all the beings in the rest of the universe. All of Satan's accusations against God have to be shown to be false. Satan has claimed that given complete freedom, every being in the universe would choose to follow his side. Is that true? Do we believe Satan's lies? No. No. Excuse me for calling them lies. No, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. God has said that a group of people living in the final days of this earth's history will remain true to him no matter what the devil will do to them. Are we ready to stand firmly on God's side? God's people are called to be holy, and that's all through the Bible. Holy means to be set aside for a special purpose. So, in what ways do Christians stand out in the world today? Can you tell a Christian walking down the street? Or do they mostly just look like their neighbors around them? Are we living truly holy lives as Adventists in 2019? We don't need to look strange. We don't need to look bizarre. How are we supposed to stand out? Well, you know what? I'm going to throw that question to you because we're running out of time. Think about it. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is for us to study these words and to think of the challenges that you have struggled with and the de- de- in your dealings with the devil and all of his machinations. Lord, help us not to be deceived by him, but to stand firm for you. Whatever is coming ahead of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.